So welcome everybody. Why don't we review a little bit um, what has happened in the in the past week? Anybody uh, would like to uh, share? Um, whoever is ready, uh, chime in. Hi, Dion. So, Jerome. What did we did discuss last week that um, that sort of uh, struck you where you thought about um, your automatic thoughts, um, how you handled them, how you uh, talk back at them, um, what, what were you able to achieve, maybe uh, change your feelings uh, about a situation and uh, shift your mindset? Yeah, that, uh, that situational analysis discussion had a, had a good impact on me last time. I, we had been finishing up the uh, the summer semester uh, with our classes at UT Dallas this week, and so I've got um, uh, typically have a situation where students you know, we, we put all the information about the course available to them, and all all the course resources, the emails we send, the syllabi we post, the discussions we have, and and inevitably somebody comes back at the end of the semester and says, you know, that they um, they didn't know they had to do this assignment, or or they weren't aware that that this was required for this assignment. And so in the past, my, my knee jerk reaction had always been, you know, well, it was in the syllabus, it's your responsibility to go and, and find that information. And, and I try to help them understand what accountability is all about, especially in a, in a professional business role. Uh, but this week I found that I was kind of taking it from a, from a different standpoint. I was, I was trying to look at it from, from their point of view and, and, and then come up with a response that would tie in more so with, with a solution based or a collaborative based solution rather than just me hammering them with the fact that they didn't uh, follow the instructions as they were supposed to. So, and I found that I had better interaction with my students by doing that. So, so that being, being aware of that situation and approaching it from a different mindset was beneficial for me. Well, that's cool. It, it shows that um, you, uh, you're discovering the power of empathy. And it's a good leadership tool. Yeah, very much so. Anybody else who would like to, to share? Maybe maybe David or Dion or uh, hi Megan. Hello. So, do you want to share something that uh, happened this week, and uh, where you become more aware of how you thought and felt, and uh, transformed your self talk? Yeah, um, I had a good one. So I was hosting a virtual uh, new hire orientation last week. And uh, as it goes with new hires, I'm fielding a lot of questions about, um, you know, access to different HR systems or um, just kind of getting things set up. And by the end of the week, I was so um, so frustrated and so short. I was happy to be responding via message um, and not in person, but taking a step back, um, that's my job. Like part of my, one of my goals is to reduce the, you know, the time that it takes for new hires to be productive. So I think stepping away from that and taking some deep breaths um, transforms that completely into a, um, an opportunity and an action that I can take and have an impact. So that was a big one. Well, where do you think um, your pressure to perform comes from? Oh, myself, definitely. <laughs> yeah, but where does it originate? <clears throat> um, I've always been, I, I've always, put pressure on myself um, and I value success. So I think I would fall into the category of uh, like perfectionists. Um, so that's something I'm always, always working on is being open and um, kind of being gentle with myself on the, the results. So there, there is a belief system uh, working in, in your mindset that uh, 
you know, I'm just making, I'm, I'm not going to put words in, in, in your mouth, but uh, my guess is that uh, you may say or may believe that um, if I don't succeed, then I'll be a failure and I will feel terrible and, and the world is going to come to an end. Pretty much. You put it well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that um, we, we're going to talk about uh, changing beliefs. And uh, I uh, thought about this week and uh, what I want to ac accomplish this week because based on what we did last week. You know, we, we talked about mindfulness in the first session. Um, we talked about a uh, little bit about that uh, mindset operating system. And, uh, and today I want to talk about the belief system and what are the origins of a belief system. But since everybody wants to achieve and everybody has that drive and everybody wants to go somewhere, um, I'd like to start first with, with goals. Um, but I don't want to cut you off. Um, if there's anybody who wants to share a quick story, uh, I'm uh, totally I'm open to that. So um, I always like when people participate and they make it real. So just unmute yourself and uh, jump in. I really liked Jerome's story, right? So I, I struggle with that where if information is presented and people go, I didn't get it, I don't know, right? I grew up in a household where it was, we, it was full on personal responsibility, right? Without a lot of empathy. And I still struggle with that, right? But, and, and I do it too, right? So it's, it's that interesting dichotomy. And there were a couple of times this past week where, you know, there's, and again, I do it too, which is why we can't come down on folks like a ton of bricks, but it's like, Hey, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. Or can you help me with this? And I'm like, it's right there. Right. So I kind of like with my kids who are 11 and eight, it's one of those things where I'm like, I expect to have to tell them multiple times. Right. And so I struggle with, sharing those expectations like hey it, it, we're all professionals here my expectation is that we're all coming to class prepared right and so i think that's the dichotomy is holding people accountable with that personal responsibility while not coming down on them like a ton of bricks right the lesson has to be learned you can't not do your homework you can't not show up prepared right that's it's rampant right now and it's a huge problem like you can't you we can't just show up so i had a couple times this week where i was like oh and then it's interesting kind of going through this because it, it always throws me for a loop where i feel you know like I'm, I'm rebuilding some of my own muscle movements in finding an appropriate response to address the accountability while still encouraging people, right, at the end of the day. And so that's definitely still something that that I work on and have to, I normally have some motions I go through to take a deep breath or put some different words together and, and recognize both. Um, but I definitely struggle with that. And like Megan was saying, definitely the perfectionist side, right? The more I can do and not have the ball in my court and, and show up prepared, then, then I'm, I'm good. I'm off the hook. I'm not the one going to get yelled at. So I think there's a lot of, you know, at the end of the day, how are we all in this together and how are we all showing up? And I, so I, I think, I don't know about all of you, but I definitely feel like I, I, I um, it's very similar to what you all were saying and then just defining and coming up with different motions to lead more effectively when quite oh, frankly Dion uh, help me understand your belief system that may say and I'm just guessing here and then you correct me and maybe you can state it more accurately than I can because you live inside your head and I don't but what uh, <laughs> What I'm guessing is that um, I believe that if I don't do all my chores or if I, uh, I believe that if I don't follow up, 
then uh, something bad is going to happen and I will get punished. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's definitely the belief system, right? Like you didn't do this, so you don't get this, right? And there's a time and a place for that, right? There's, but not in everyday life, right? Not completing your chores isn't the end of the world. So the lesson learned, I think, is good. But yeah, for us and, you know, growing up that way, absolutely, right? And, you know, I think we all have parental stories, but on my cheek right here, when I was a toddler, I fell and I had this gash. And when I was younger, it was really prevalent. And in high school, my stepmom looks at me and she's like, you would be so pretty if you didn't have that scar. <laughs> I'm like, what? So as much as we go, and I think everybody has that story, but it's, you know, those, I think it's the, to what we were talking about last week is the awareness of some of those things and then recognizing how to kind of jujitsu them out of your own head, right? And, and have a response for it. So, right. yeah. So you uh, you skirted the issue a little bit uh, by not uh, uh, really diving a little bit deeper. What were the consequences if you didn't do your jobs? Uh, it sounds like you got a lot of directives and uh, there was not a lot of empathy. There was just uh, a lot of orders to execute. Yeah. So it, it sounds like the, the environment was more like, uh, you know, do as I say, and uh, or else. So yeah. uh, talk about the or else. What, what was the worst that happened? You know, in some cases, you know, back in the day, we still got spankings, right? So whether it was the, the old spatula or a belt, so that always happened, right? Or sometimes it was just that stark emotional disapproval and coldness, right? And sometimes it was the... I. I would love you if, right? So it was a lot of that conditional support and conditional love, which is not how kids should be raised. Right. Um, so it was, it was definitely sometimes physical and sometimes more of that emotional, oh, verbal, right. mental. Right. So then fast forward to today, if um, you deliver something to somebody and they don't deliver back to you, uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> So I like to think that I've evolved a little bit. And so when that happens, um, it depends, right? So I think when I head into a work situation, it's definitely, I have to be in the right place for that, right? And so when some when deadlines are missed or things of that nature, I've tried to develop more of the muscle movements that are like, hey, help me understand because we had an agreement, right? So I've had to learn to try to eke out the, the anger, right? Because I'm not angry, I'm annoyed. Right. We didn't do what they said they were going to do. And I've got huge issues with the lack of integrity, myself included, if I don't do it, I feel bad. Oh, I should have done something. I'm, I'm really sorry. Let me try to fix it. Right. So I, I, I feel like I've, I've, I've tried to grow a little bit more and, and be more uh, cognizant of those different emotions and then recognize how to use them appropriately. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes you feel like hitting them with a spatula. I do. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm like, please stop giving me more work because you're not doing your homework. Now I'm just right. annoyed. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> And, yeah. um, and, and today we're going to talk about exactly that, where uh, you, you're already aware that there's a belief system that was conditioned by your interaction with your parents that uh, if I don't execute on their commands, then I got to get hit um, and I get the belt or something and it's not pleasant. And, and then your belief system survived and you're operating uh, within that framework of the belief system in the adult world and that it's interfering with your ability to enjoy yourself and um and we're going to talk about al uh, alternative ways to function and let go of that old belief system and transform it into a more realistic and and more practical and more helpful and less stressful belief system that will get you the job, get get the job done, 
and uh, and feel better about it, and and not having to go through the spatula belt sidetrack. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know about anybody else here too, but I think, you know, just doing some of the work that I've done over the last little bit, there's, there's almost like these, these moments of clarity, right? We're like, oh, all right. You know, I feel like you go through, or I've gone through some of those evolutions. I'm like, okay, good. Right. And then the muscle memory is good. And then something else happens and it's almost like a trigger and it's two steps forward and then one step back at the end of the day. So I think there's a point of it that's always a work in progress, which is fine, right? And then, but right. how do you kind of, right. if you kind of in the green? And, uh, and you also, you, you told me uh, uh, the other day that you were journaling, so you're, you're becoming more aware of that habitual patterns. And uh, so you're assembling a narrative. Mm -hmm. And now the next challenge is to edit that narrative. And what are the the possibilities and and how how do you edit from what perspective um, so you can edit from an emotional perspective from a logical perspective um, from a humorous perspective you you know when you an editor uh, of your thoughts or your memories or your beliefs uh, you can wear different hats and uh, and that different perspective gives you then more choices uh, and you move away from the black and white choice that you're living with right now. Um, sorry, John, no, I did not uh, uh, react immediately to you. Uh, it's okay. I mean, if you want to move on, you can move on. I, I, uh, I just want to throw in this concept of the narcissistic wound. It's a, it's a huge psychological insight. And it, it, once you get a little bit of awareness of your narcissistic wound, you really can stop behaving so habitually. So I, I have a theory that most salespeople are very insecure and their narcissistic wound is solved by p selling something to people and getting that external adulation uh, recognition uh, that they're okay because they did something like, um, so, you know, mine for much of my life was, you know, being the top performer, um, always wanting to do better, uh, winning the awards, blah, 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 and never being happy. And what I was trying to do is fill this wound, this childhood wound that was un unconsciously saying, John, you're not good enough. And so you need to fill the wound and get the love you never got. And it creates some horrible behaviors. I mean, it creates great behaviors because I was very successful and it drove me a lot. But then you, you know, you, you're angry underneath it or you get disappointed easily or um, you get hurt. So once you get once you can discover what that narcissistic wound is, you're much healthier going into anything you go into, whether it's your relationship or if like when I used to teach, when I was like teaching like crazy, you know, I get my feedback and if, you know, I wouldn't focus on the X number that said my program was good. I would focus on the one that said it wasn't right. Or if somebody wasn't paying attention to me in the class, I would like, I was like, how dare you not pay attention to me? And it's like, well, what about all the other people that are? And so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't change my behavior until I realized what, what that was. So I'm sure that goes into one of your three elements. Um, but the narcissistic wound is really a good way of looking at it because it really, um, it gets to the emotion of something. Right. And so, by getting to the emotion of it, you can get past it right. much more easily. Do you remember the first um, uh, week we discussed uh, the floaters, the grabbers? That's the man. That was one of those sticker. three, right? So you you have a sticker, and yeah. uh, and the challenge is, how do you change the sticker? And we're going to talk about that. And right. there's a process. And um, I think that the fact that you are putting that label, the narcissistic wound, uh, you know, there's another term, primal injury, and um, you know, there, there's a, a, a lifelong yearning to 
um, move past the wrongs of our childhood, right. which is not the best way to lead a life uh, where you can reach your full potential. And eventually we need to learn how to let go of that old mindset and shift it so we can become the best version of us and not constantly be held back when a new situation arises. Either you lose a sale and then you feel crappy again, or you win a sale and you wonder why it hasn't been enough. You know, it could have yep. been bigger. Um, yes, yeah, there's a huge, and there's such a huge attachment to that. And part of what's great about psychology and mindfulness is if you can see the attachment and you can see the uh, habit energy, then you can get clearer about things. Right. So, right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad you, you raised your hand. Um, and that, that was a, a significant insight. And um, it's a good jumping off point to me sharing my screen. And uh, we, uh, you know, we in week three. And uh, what I'd like to uh, also share with you, we have recorded all those previous sessions and I've gotten it back from the editor. I've uploaded already three uh, uh, parts. I uh, cut every class into two parts, about an, an hour each. And um, you're gonna get a link uh, later this afternoon with all four um, recorded videos. And um, I wanna start out quickly with uh, setting goals. Um, you know, we all want something. We want to do something really meaningful for our, uh, with our lives. And yet only 27% of salespeople and sales leaders have goals in writing. And uh, the University of Scranton, uh, Scranton survey shows that 92% uh, of people that set New Year goals never achieve them. And the reason goal setting is such a haphazard thing is because uh, people never take time to uh, consciously write down their dreams and goals. You know, we, uh, we seem to be hung up on uh, the idea that life is sort of a free floating uh, improvisational event that uh, does not need a direction because we are so busy all the time. And, and the busyness uh, prevents us from really truly looking at ourselves and say, what do I want for myself? what do you want to achieve? Um, and in our mindset tra training, you know, we ask people, how many of you have uh, specific goals in writing? And it usually every class says it's about 27, 30% um, have their goals in writing. And here's the thing about goal setting. Um, if you want to do it right, you want to be clear about the what, the why, and the how. And when, when we did this, uh, you know, in, in, in about five sessions, it was the same things where we asked people, create your wall of dreams in the office while people were still going to offices. And uh, one uh, sales manager said, I want to go heli skiing in Alaska. Uh, another person said, I want to do a yoga workshop in India. Uh, one sales uh, BD, BDR said, I want to rent a, a summer house in, in Umbria where my grandfather grew up. And I want to bring my kids there so they can see where my grandfather uh, grew up. Uh, another guy said, well, I want to uh, have a dancey speedboat for the weekend and have fun. Or somebody wanted to drive a Bugatti. And uh, when they created that wall of dreams, uh, one team put it right next to their leaderboard where they had their numbers. So the company uh, has a dream of growing numbers, but people have a, a different intention. They want to grow their dreams. They want to grow in the direction of their dreams. And by having those pictures on the walls, um, it makes for a more interesting conversation. And, uh, and then salespeople We'll help one another by sharing best practices. And uh, the, the guy on the upper left uh, 
Neil Sexton, he, uh, no, Jim Sexton, he uh, achieved his goals like with, with, with like four months and he actually uh, paid for his brother to go with him heli skiing in Alaska. And the next year he made so much more money because of that mindset training and goal focused living is that he took like 10 people with him and uh, he bought a custom home. So he uh, progressively realized his dreams. And uh, the guy who was dreaming about the yoga workshop, he uh, loved yoga so much that he discovered there is a need for teaching people how to make a handstand in six weeks and how to do yoga handstands. And that was, that was his specialty. And today he left his sales job and today he is teaching um, virtually. But last year he made $250,000 a year teaching people how to make handstands. Um, so the, the next thing is the why. Why do you want to achieve a goal? So when you write down your goal, think about the why. Because the bigger the why, the bigger the try, and the easier the how. And there's a, a story about Justin Rose that really intrigued me. When he was 17, he almost won the British Open. And when you watch it um, on YouTube, you see that the last shot he held out um, on the last hole from about 40 yards and it was riveting and he was in fourth place and his dream was to uh, win the US Open and uh, he quit and uh, signed up as a pro and then he missed the next 21 consecutive cuts and uh, that's something that uh, we discussed earlier about achievement which is it's, it's really uh, intriguing to me that um, the more things you want, you know, let me, yeah, make this bigger. Um, the more things you want, the, the more elusive things become and the more vulnerable you become to your own head games. So he needed to readjust his mindset and he saw a psychologist and the psychologist asked him a simple question. Why do you want to win the U.S. Open? Why do you play golf? What is, uh, and he says, well, I want to be in the newspaper. I want to be uh, featured on the, on the Daily Mail or the, you know, the uh, London Times or uh, I want to be in Life Magazine or whatever. And, and he wanted to win. And he wanted to have that win sort of demonstrated in the media. So he wanted to, some, wanted to have something that's external. And the psychologist said, why don't you think about what you want on the inside? And uh, so the old mindset was playing to win, beat the competition. And the new mindset it was, I want to, become, uh, to know how good I can become at this game. And, and then he started to win. And he had a new focus. He had a new mission. He had something that was more internally focused. And then he, he also learned how to focus on his inner game of golf by not watching the clock, by not looking at the score, by not getting distracted by other people that were with him in the foursome. And, uh, and that mindset shift towards 100% focus without distraction, that one shot will not contaminate the next one or influence the next one because there are ups and downs. There are highs and lows in golf. When you have a bad shot, you're in a low mood. If you're in a, in a, in a top condition and get the ball to land where you want, then you're in that high mood. And that high mood is just as sabotaging as the low mood. And it impacts your game. And there's a guy in DC, McKenzie. Uh, he has, uh, uh, I get his golf, uh, newsletter. And he talks about the mindset constantly. So I want to go back to the, the image that in order to improve your, your mindset, you want to look at it as a garden and your mind is like a garden and your memories are the seeds. And your job is to water the flowers and stop watering the weeds. So when 
uh, Megan talks about her seeds of perfectionism. You know, those seeds are related to a belief system. Um, and I want to give you one story, Sarah Blakely, where she changed her belief system by, um, you know, she grew up in a household where um, her parents got divorced when she was 16, which she blamed herself for. Um, then in the same year, her best friend died in a car crash and she got depressed and she thought life has come to an end the way she knew it. And then somebody gave her a set of tapes by Wayne Dyer and Dr. Wayne Dyer has, has been famous for uh, a cassette series called uh, No Limit Thinking. This, he wrote a book called uh, The Sky's the Limit. And uh, she has listened to those tapes like 400 times in her car to the point that when her friends uh, got with her in the car, they couldn't stand it anymore. And she could almost quote him verbatim. So she implanted literally uh, no limited thoughts in her mind. And then she made it through college. She did really well. And then she had the idea of uh, creating Spanx and people told her, you cannot get a patent for that. You cannot get, uh, you know, a legal foundation for your business. Uh, this cannot be manufactured. Uh, you're not going to get investment money. And she persisted. She went to like uh, 14 patent lawyers until she found somebody who helped her get a patent. And then she got manufacturing. She found uh, somebody to lend her money. And I know a woman in Atlanta where she lives now that uh, was in an improv group with her in a theater group. And, uh, and she was working, she knew she was working on Spanx, but she didn't have distribution. And uh, they had an assignment for the following week. And she said before she left, I may not be there next week because I'm meeting with a buyer from Macy's and if, if I get a distribution deal, I'm not gonna continue with this improv work. And sure enough, she didn't show up. And uh, fast forward, um, a few years ago, she was named by Forbes magazine as uh, one of the most successful female entrepreneurs. And she's now worth uh, $1.1 billion. So when you think about your goals, think about no limit thinking. What if you removed all the limits? So what I encourage you between now and next week is to write down your goal, number one. Number two, write down why you want to go. And number three, think in terms of if there were no limits, when could you reach that goal? And the next thing is an accountability partnership. Find somebody that you report to on a weekly basis whether it's a friend or a family member or a peer and talk about your goals once a week, talk about your progress, talk about what's holding you back and, and then also create that wall of dreams and on your refrigerator or your bathroom mirror and, uh, you know, and visualize that what you want to achieve on a daily basis. It sounds maybe silly to you, but, it has a very powerful effect. So, any questions? Anybody? We're good? I want to make sure that uh, this is recording. Jonathan, what do, you, what do you think about this so far? Well, I teach smart goals, Gerhard. Yes. And, um, the, you know, the fun part of smart goals is writing them down. But, but they're kind of meaningless unless there's that why, unless there's that emotion behind it. And, and when I teach the smart goal, to me, the A is aligned and agreed upon. And that's where you talk about the person. So can I tell you a very quick story? Of course. 
1994, I wanted to start my own sales training business. Um, divorced. Two households to pay for. Um, and the way I was going to start my business was going into a business that there was no salary, no nothing. You know, very big commissions, big opportunity. So I wrote my smart goal down of having to make a certain amount of money by the end of the year. And um, I, the A, which to me is the most important part, because that's where you get the support. Uh, I had to have alignment and agreement. And one of the people I had to have alignment and agreement with was my ex-wife. Because I had to say to her or ask her whether she would support me in this and the benefit would be that I would be able to take care of her and the kids better. And it meant I might spend a little less time with the kids while I get going. And, um, you know, long story short, knock on wood, you know, I be, you know, things were successful. And I don't think I could have done it without her. Um, so, you know, unless there's a real emotion and desire behind it, I think that's why so many fail, so many New Year's resolutions fail. And, uh, and I do think that the people behind you who will hold you accountable and support you and motivate you are critical because, you know, changing behavior is like super hard. So that's, um, that would be, I, I'm, a, I'm a full-fledged supporter of what you're saying here. Thank you. Anybody well, else want to chime in on that? Mary, what about you? Uh, you sorry, I had to step away, so I didn't hear the question, but hope everyone's doing well. We, we are doing well, and, and I'm glad you joined because we're going to come to something very critical. Um, Mike, um, do you have any goals in writing? I uh, just wrote down that I'd like to pursue national accounts for my business. And why? Well, I'd like to play bigger. I think that we have developed uh, certain core competencies in our, in our territory. And, um, you know, I think that I see us pushing the envelope in all the other directions I could name in our, in our sales channels. But I don't, I think that we could, that may be a direction that we can take soon. So what would that do for you emotionally? Uh, it excites me. It fires me up. I think that, uh, you know, Playing with big accounts is an exciting idea. And, um, you know, I think uh, working with other growing companies or building new new sites would be uh, a good match at this what, what, given where we what are. Would be, what would be the limits? Um, in my head, I think about the limits around like legal constraints and contracts and getting things on paper um, for national deals like that. That to me is the obstacle and having those things in place when it's, when it's time to you know, make a deal. Right. What about um, accountability? Who would be your accountability partner? Absolutely. I'd say our top salesperson. I'm sitting in his office. Uh, that's my brother-in-law. Good. Yep. All right. So uh, that's a good plan. So why don't we uh, move Thank on? You. And uh, I expect a success report next week from you. How is that? All right. Step All right. Up. Thanks. Good. All right. So now we come to... Um, let me share my screen again. Uh, we come to the six core beliefs. And, uh, you know, I could have had 10 or, or 20, but I want to narrow it down to six. The first one is your belief about relationships. Uh, we're going to talk about how, how those beliefs were created, how those beliefs are helping you win, how those beliefs are holding you back, and how you can transform the beliefs. Same with education, same with work, with money, with success and fitness. So those are, in my opinion, the, the six core beliefs that are the foundation of your success. And all those beliefs are beliefs that you have unconsciously developed uh, in collaboration with your parents when you think about the implanted mindset, uh, and those are limiting beliefs. Then you worked with uh, mentors or coaches and teachers, and the, that is the imprinted mindset, where you worked with people that impressed you. And then you ad adapted probably a little bit different beliefs because of that. 
And then there's the inspired mindset, which is sort of that no limit thinking that uh, where you discover that you have some inner magic and that you have the power to move beyond the implanted and beyond the imprinted. So what I'd like to ask uh, you now, uh, get a piece of paper and, uh, and work on this for maybe a minute or two and describe your beliefs about relationships and also describe a recent relationship challenge. So I give you about a couple of minutes, shouldn't take long, um, and then we are going to discuss that. Well, unmute yourself. I am unmuted. So uh, I guess my core belief around relationships is, uh, is our job to make uh, each other feel loved. Does not just loving someone doesn't count. Uh, having them feel that they're loved is kind of the goal. So that's, uh, I guess, my core underlying belief. A uh, recent challenge is in a new relationship. And my mind works, uh, if you say something, it sparks another idea, sparks another idea, and that's my superpower. But in our relationship, she'll be telling me about something, and that makes me think of something else that you can see on my face that I've already left where she was and gone to another thought. And that was causing some challenges. And it's like, hey, stay with me. I can tell you're not here in the present moment. And for me, the initial thought was, why don't you be more interesting? And I would be there, but uh, it just uh, took a while to realize that, you know, Hey, it's my issue. And if I love that person, respect that person that I need to fight the instinct to let my mind wander and spark ideas and just stay focused and present. So when you, when you go back to the belief, um, feeling loved, where does that belief come from? So when I got married, I was the most, the most romantic person. And really love was really important to me. And my wife told me, you know, you're not romantic, right? And it's like, what? And I really had that self delusion that I was, and it turns out I was not. I thought I knew what love was and I really didn't. So my relationship with my wife was eye-opening, transformative, and I really got the belief from her. And our first year or so of being madly in love and, and a lot of struggle, and as we came out of that is I was transformed. So I got it well, when I was when 32. When you um, think about your upbringing, um, and growing up with your parents or caretakers. Yes. Uh, what was the relationship like? It was very challenged. We had uh, moved, immigrated to the UK when I was three. And my dad fully embraced uh, the West and everything uh, British and was amazing. And my mom was like, wait a minute, sailor, don't forget about our culture. And it caused lots of friction, lots of fights. So it was not a happy experience. How old were you? Uh, three when we got there, probably self-aware, uh, aware of it, probably five or six. And how did you feel about uh, losing your old culture? And uh, When you're three, there is no old culture. It's just what's in front of you. Like you're fully present in the moment. But experiencing uh their fights was uh was impactful so the uh, the the fights um that that you experienced uh, did they um make you feel unloved no uh they got me to shut down like be smaller than i was So they may have made me feel unloved, but I wasn't aware of it. Right. So the, the idea that uh, comes into my mind when I listen to you is, is engagement. Um, so your parents uh, disengaged from their country. 
uh, your your father engaged enthusiastically with the so, new uh, new country? Actually, I think uh, it's probably more true that uh, they disengaged from each other, which is right. more pivotal. Right. 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 So uh, they're disengaged, and then you disengaged as well uh, from from your own heart uh, because mm -hmm. you were, your exposure uh, to their love was minimized, and you felt minimized and. You're, sm you're smirking. Oh, just the uh, the mind reading. You felt minimized. It was like, well, I'm not sure that's the correct articulation, but yeah, oh. it had an impact. Yeah. But it's like, so, uh, anyway, please go on. Dr. Gerhard. <laughs> <laughs> um, have, you, have you read the book, The Art of Loving by Dr. Eric Fromm? I have not. You'd love that book, and um, you, you you're going to uh, come back with a different language about about love, and um, and I I also want to reflect on on the the relationship challenge that you're facing when you uh, speak with her and you associate. Um, and, and you, you seem to be proud that you have that mental capacity that you're very bubbly, but you, uh, you seem to be outside her zone of interest. In, in other words, you, you can associate within a, um, a universe of ideas, or you can, you know, let, let's say the, the, the She's talking about the Milky Way, and there's a lot, lot to talk about the Milky Way. But then you see a green planet, and you say, "Well, let's talk about Mars." And uh, and and the mental capacity that you you have uh, is to direct your curiosity, to lead your curiosity to a place where she feels comfortable with. So I think actually, what's going on is you can feel when somebody is there with you. There's a connection there, regardless of what you're talking about. And when my mind wanders to another thought, she feels the loss of connection from it. And I'm kind of interested in the thought because it ties into what we were talking about. And so it's been uh, uh, a conscious effort not to do that. I still do that once in a while, but uh, compared to two months ago, dramatically better. But the interesting part for me was not that I was doing it, is that I was unaware of it. And so when somebody first points out that, you know, you're doing this, it's like, there's a defensiveness comes up. And that was really intriguing for me. It's like, well, wait a minute. I am paying attention and then realizing that no, I'm not. And I am disconnecting. And so it's interesting well, how would you tell the image we have of ourselves? Yeah. yeah, Uma, how would you describe the difference between being in love with an idea and being in love with a person? So, uh, and it depends on the relationship, the loving relationship with the person, but there's obviously uh, more warmth, more connection. Uh, at least for me, I can bask in the love of an idea is when I love another human being, there's a reaction there that glow is heartwarming. And when I come up with a brilliant idea that I love, it's like, it's still just an inanimate object that isn't really reflecting any warmth back. So yeah, loving someone war warms your own heart. Well said, thank you. Um, who else wants to chime in on this uh, conversation uh, about relationships? How do you define uh, relationships? Uh, anybody? Thank you, Uma. I'll jump in, Gerhard. Yes. Um, I mean, from, from a big picture side, of course, relationships are important, especially in, in the business world, in the sales world, on you know maintaining successful long-term engagement with with customers and clients and 
those kind of things. But I, but I think it's also uh, one of the parts that gets overlooked oftentimes is how important it is for us, for, for relationships to be strong that we're involved in. I, some of you may be, may be familiar with the TED talk that Susan Pinker did a couple of years ago. Um, she was talking about the secrets to living longer I have a lot more to do with our social life than with things we do on the outside, just like uh, Umar was talking about there. As a matter of fact, she listed the, the top of five items that are, are, are key to long life or longevity. Number one is social integration. And so that, you know, not only building a relationship one-on-one -on -one with somebody, but building relationships with lots of different people in, in a social environment. Close relationships was ranked as number two. I thought that was interesting uh, to see how that played out. Uh, it was also interesting to see that exercise was number seven. So that made me feel pretty good because uh, my exercise routine has been the same for 58 years. I do one sit up a day. I do half of it when I get out of the bed in the morning and the other half when I go back to bed at night. So exercise has not been a real big part of my life. And, and that's something that I need to, uh, to address as I go forward as well. It's one of my goals that I have on my list. But it's interesting. We talk about this relationship thing. I think it's really important um, for us as business professionals, for those of us that are, 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 are you know, looking to be in, in leadership or are be in roles where we're helping other people develop, that, that, that social integration and building those relationships are two of the most important things, not only for the people we work with, but also for ourselves to in, increase our longevity. Uh, John Guyton joined us. Um, what, uh, uh, have you listened to the conversation? Hi, John. Uh, just, yeah, you know, just jumping on. So, no, just coming in. I came in right. and talked about his, his workout routine, which I thought was fantastic. Right. How, how would you define uh, relationships? What's your definition of relationships? Your, your belief system about relationships? My belief system about relationships, uh, I think it is a transfer of energy. Um, you know, talking about every aspect of human interaction, um, everything is an exchange of energy, literally. And so it's important to, when you think about relationships, at least how I see it, when you think about relationships, you think about what is that exchange of energy, right? Whether it's a business relationship, family relationship, a romantic relationship, um, that exchange is there. And when you realize that, then all of a sudden your perspective changes. Um, you know, in your personal relationships, you, you think, okay, what, what energy am I giving to this, right? And in return, what energy am I getting for this as well? That's why they say, if you hang around nine broke people, you'd be the 10th. If you hang around nine negative people, you'd be the 10th. You hang around nine positive people, you'd be the 10th. You bring, right? You hang around nine successful people, you'd be the 10th. That's the reason why it's because it's energy. And so that energy, you're either getting that or, you know, you're either giving more than you're getting or vice versa. So um, that's, uh, that's my take as far as relationship goes. Thank you. Um, Jerome, I go back. Um you have not answered the second part of the question. Can you do that? Of the, uh, about a recent situation? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a recent situation uh, with work recently uh, where a, a decision was made concerning uh, some resources we use in the classroom and those resources were, were taken away from us right in the middle of the semester with no discussion about uh, how that would impact or the implications of doing that. So still, still working through some of that, but that's been a little bit of a of a um, of a challenge for me to take on over the last few weeks. So de describe your uh, relationships with your parents and how they helped you sort of come to a definition of what is a good relationship. Yeah, I um, my parents it was not a good relationship. I was the youngest of five children, and by the time. I came along, I think their relationship was pretty much over there. All of my brothers and sisters were born uh, within a year or two of each other. There was seven years between my next oldest brother and myself. So um, I, I don't know if I was the mistake or what happened in that relationship. But nonetheless, by, I can remember by the time I was about five or six years old that, um, that their relationship as, as a husband and wife, as a couple, pretty much didn't exist. Um, I learned a lot from both of my parents in, in different areas, but, but as far as building a relationship with somebody, there was not much of an example there, no. So um, having grown up with a, um, 
a situation where the relationship was sort of to a certain degree dysfunctional. Um, how do you fix that? That's a great question. I am. Um... part of what I'm hoping from, to get from, from this series over the next few weeks as well. But, uh, I, you know, I, I guess what I try to do is look at it from, from the standpoint of, you know, what, what parts of it didn't work and, and try to call those out of what I do. And then maybe look at the things that did work and try to put those into what I do. Right. Um, see, see uh, Jerome, the, you know, your answer to the definition of a relationship was, uh, clinical, um, you know, you say it's vital to business. Uh, then you quoted uh, Susan Tinker and and her five uh, steps to uh, long, longevity. Um, so it it is sort of a sign that uh, there is no clear definition yet. You know, uh, you you have sort of hunches what uh, what is a good relationship. Well, what is a, a good belief system about relationships? And, uh, and then you have also the relationship with yourself on a, on a physical level and on an intellectual level. On an intellectual level, you're a giant. You know, you are, you're a professor. You show that you uh, can uh, get a, a degree at age 57, which is extraordinary. So that shows for a lot of cognitive uh, capacity. So you're pushing yourself uh, into, a, you know, a compare, a physically equivalent would be a marathon runner, you know, to, and, and have a, a great finish. And then the physical relationship with yourself is uh, atrophied, uh, or it can be improved and you want to improve it. And you wonder why you don't, because you know all the benefits of uh, of uh, walking and running and aerobics and eating and uh, you know fitness, and you probably know more about fitness than anybody else. But for some reason, uh, that is you know, look at your dad and what he did physically, and uh, look at your mom what she did physically, and. Um, and then, um, you know, look at John Guyton, what um, he learned a, as a college collegial athlete and how he, uh, you know, made the transformation from, uh, you know, developed himself physically, but then he made a transformation to uh, contributing to uh, society by uh, being a mentor, being a teacher and, and, and sort of doing a, a similar job than what you were doing, impacting young minds and then helping uh, other people grow. 